Uh, so hey guys, I'm Tony. Uh, I am an analyst or transmission analyst in a sprint day job, which I guess is just like a domain specific term, transmission analyst, but just like another analyst. Um, yeah, and I joined the R4DS community whenever the Advanced Art Book Club started. Kind of glad to get to know a lot of different people here and now doing this book club. Uh, and so this chapter uh, kind of just was pretty straightforward. I was kind of surprised at how short it was. Um, and it's probably one of the simpler chapters in the book. So maybe there's not too much to discuss, but um, you know, hopefully we had, we, there's some good nuggets of information in this. And I figured I would kind of stick with the theme of having like fall colors. So I went with, uh, it was basic and got the typical pumpkin orange here. <laughs> Amazing. So yeah, there's only four topics in the chapter, distributions, descript descriptive statistics, graphics, and tables. And I think pretty much everyone's going to be familiar with this. So if anyone's got comments, like go ahead and like jump in. I'm typically pretty bad at reading comments like left in the chat. So I might miss that. And we'll look toward that at the end. But yeah, so let's start with the distributions. So I guess the simple way of describing it is just like a profile of a variable. Um, if you want to be like more technical, it's like a function or probability, like a probability function or a function mapping, you know, values to some probability range. Um, so, you know, I, in my head, I always just think of like a histogram or something. And it just depends on like the context you're talking about, like what kind of distribution. Um, uh, and then usually when we're talking about distributions, we end up talking about the different types of variables here. So continuous and discrete, you can break down discrete into binary or categorical. Categorical having more than two levels. Um, the categorical, you know, this kind of maps to the, to the, the concept of factors in R, uh, unordered or ordered or ordinal here. Um, in some contexts, you might be like tempted to treat ordinal or ordered uh, variables or categories like a continuous variable, but usually it's a bad choice to do that, and which is why, you know, keeping them as uh, categorical variables. And yeah, so the book kind of mentions a couple other you know, related concepts here, uh, PDF and CDF moments, which, uh, you know, are just a, a classification of mean variance, and you get up to like kurtosis and then higher order types of moments. Uh, I don't know how interesting, like just describing each of those individually are, so we won't talk too much about it. Um, there's quantiles, uh, which, you know, median is kind of grouped under, uh, median being the, the 50th uh, percentile. Uh, oh yeah, so I did actually, I did have links here. I thought these were interesting. So the person that created, so Gina Reynolds, so she created the flipbook R package and she's got a couple of interesting like short presentations that kind of try to describe some of these concepts. So here I think this is PDF and CDF that are going to be shown here. So we see the, you know, the PDF here, this like typical histogram kind of distribution uh, and then the CDF overlay it here. Uh, and then I think she goes on and kind of, you, you see how like, uh, you know, Increasing values along your uh, distribution, you know, you're feeling it in your histogram or your curve, uh, your dumbbell curve. So, like, these are lower probabilities along your, you know, your PDF. Something that's maybe like under one standard deviation below the mean, up to you know the mean, and then all the way through the distribution. So this is like maybe your 99th percentile. Um, so if we maybe have like a population of people. Uh, and we're just like looking at the heights of the population. You know, maybe your your seven foot people are over here all the way to the right, and you're like, you know, four foot five people over here to the left. Then you have maybe your average height here, and I don't know, that depends on gender or whatever. But maybe for like a male, it's like five ten or something. Females maybe five four. I actually don't even know, but uh, yeah, I guess that's the typical example for distributions, and that's kind of an easy way to think about it and just a uh, practical example. Uh, and then I think she goes on, shows here, you know, doing that same PDF, but this time like uh, doing it, uh, drawing out the CDF for it. So adding up, you know, probabilities to come up with the CDF curve. Uh, 
you know, I think that's a, you know, people that understand this, it's maybe how you kind of imagine it, but it's kind of nice to visualize like this. I thought it was, that was cool and was something we could share. Uh, and then something, something with moments here. I think here I found actually, it's always hard to visualize variants or think about variants, at least for me. I found this pretty interesting. She first of all broke down the equations and we won't stare at them too long um, because I think the visuals are kind of cooler. So here we're seeing like residuals from a mean um, and then building up the equation for like, if we go back, you know, the, the numerator term here, the summation of basically all your residuals over the sample size, we're kind of building up that equation here. Um, you know, here we're taking basically like areas within the residuals uh, and then dividing out your sample size to kind of picture what that variance looks like. So I thought that was pretty cool. If you ever had a question on how do you, you know, kind of picture all of this, you know, this is a good thing to look at. I think it's pretty similar for standard deviation. And she does some other stuff too. But I thought those things were cool, so I figured we'd show them. Uh, so yeah, there's not too much to break down here. I think the most important question that comes up for me is mean or median. Like a lot of times, uh, you know, you're trying to figure out, you're trying to show your boss something. Okay, like do I just show them what the average was? Oh, it just, you know, it depends, right? Um, I think for the most part, the intuition is to use the mean unless there's like heavy outliers. In that case, you know, use the median. Uh, but there's kind of a couple other rules here. So yeah, if there's extreme values, use the median. Um, if there's heavy ties, uh, that usually distorts the median. So hopefully the, the rest of the distribution is kind of normal and the mean is fine. And then this is the last thing I kind of here I'll touch with upon a little bit is, is uh, if the distribution is like well behaved. Uh, use a mean. So I think that can be interpreted in a lot of ways. Um, I think the way I thought about this is like, if you're trying to, if you're going to do some maybe like frequentist test, like a t-test with, you know, your estimate of like, if you just bring in a, a linear model, and you got your coefficient estimates, you know, you're going to be using maybe the mean if you want to like normalize to some scale afterwards, that's where the mean is going to be helpful um, compared to using the median because uh, the median, I don't know, I, don't, I, don't, I guess there's probably a lot of statistical theory about how you could like normalize around the median, but I think using the mean is kind of more natural in that kind of context. Tony? Yes. Can I ask a quick question? What is meant by heavy ties? Uh, so that's like, uh, so if we had like a range, like 10 numbers, and then uh, let's say like it was, you had one and then like three, two, so one, two, 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 and then like five, six, seven, eight, nine, so that there'd be like three twos there. So we say there's a heavy tie of a two there. And so maybe let's say there's like four twos there, right? So one, two, 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 and then you have like the other numbers to make a you know a sample size of ten. Well, if you looked at the median there, it would be two. Um, but maybe like if you just took the average of that distribution, it'd probably be closer to five. You know, if you say we're sampling you know, between one and ten, um, so like. Having the two there and having so many twos kind of distorts um, our understanding of where like the central part of the distribution is. Um, but yeah, it, it depends on context. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think there's some discussion of what you know, the limitations of each of those things are. So as we mentioned with mean, you know, there's extreme values. Same thing with range. A range has like the same trouble, like, you know, maybe then, you know, the fifth percentile to the 95th percentile of your distribution is between one and a hundred, but then you have like, you know, one value that's a million that just throws off your conception of range, right? Um, median, as we said, heavy ties, standard deviation and variance, uh, they struggle with asymmetric data. Um, so that kind of just goes back to, I guess, the, a lot of times when we're using those statistics, we almost assume like a normal distribution or maybe a uniform distribution. So if we don't have that, then those aren't going to be good statistics to use. Uh, and then the coefficient of variation. I don't really use this one much, but I think it's just the, like a measure of dispersion where you do standard deviation divided by the mean. Uh, yeah, I don't really use that one much, but here's a limitation. If it's, uh, if you're, you're uh, well, if your distribution has a non-zero mean that it won't be very good to use. 
Which the variance is um, used quite a lot in uh, ELISA testing and uh, you know uh, biological testing. So you know how close are your measurements or your replicates to each other? How how good is your your accuracy, so to speak? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So it's, if you have like normal data, then I think yeah, standard deviation variants are going to be good um, as a measure of dispersion. Um, and, Precision, maybe. Maybe I'm throwing around accuracy, precision. I know those are different uh, terms, but um, yeah, in those cases, variance, you're going to want the variance to help understand like um, how dispersed your data is. Okay, graphing. So this is the third topic. Uh, so he out, he kind of discusses a couple concepts that, that he himself got from a different, from some reference. Um, here are two that are kind of just grouped together uh, where, he, you know, the principle of uh, having data, or like showing your data as a really like position or as a positional or length kind of feature. Um, and like the obvious example or you know, the data viz sin of using pie charts, kind of like the one, <laughs> I don't know, like the best example of where that's violated. Uh, and then uh, obviously the, percep the, the perception of angles, slopes and volumes kind of goes along with that. That's also violated with the, the whole pie charts are bad thing where you know, we don't, we as humans don't perceive angles and areas very well, right? Like you might be showing 75% on like a pie chart, but it looks like much larger just because our brain kind of like interprets the area differently than it should. Uh, so then, yeah, kind of pie charts here. And I actually, all these are links. I just kind of wanted to go to this one site that I think is really awesome. Uh, I think this cool. From data to viz, they have like a bunch of, they have this whole caveat page where they it goes through all the data viz sense essentially. Well, that didn't work. Um, but I kind of linked through a couple of these, but if you want like more uh, details about why each of these things are bad or why certain charts are bad um, or where not to use them, it kind of has good examples of each of those things. Um, so I don't know, I think we've all heard pie charts are bad, uh, but you know, the same. Principles are violated here with like a radial chart. Like, why even show this as a radial chart? It should just be a bar chart. Uh, <laughs> uh, circular bar plots as well. So histograms and density plots, uh, we might have all heard of this too. Like sometimes with histograms, your choice of bin size uh, can really change your interpretation of your data. <laughs> and same with, you know, density plots are often is said to be the a good alternative to it, but even with that, uh, your kernel parameter, or uh, I think in ggplot, it's like bin width. It'll sometimes like print out what the auto chosen bin width is if you use um, geo intensity. Uh, like even that choice can lead to like distortions of your perception of your data. There's like just always being aware of the limitations of each type of uh, data viz is good. Uh, so it's, it's funny that we're like, we're all analysts or maybe statisticians, but you know, you know, the communication of your data and your insights through visualization is like, is almost everything. Like if you can't communicate it, then like all your analysis is for nothing. <laughs> uh, so there's more examples here. Uh, let's see stack bar charts, the box plots. Uh, I found this interesting, like there was some good discussion about box plots. Um, uh, not like, I guess they can hide information. Um, you know, they show outliers, but even like the choice of uh, how the box width is um, defined, I think the normal way it's defined is, uh, you know, 1.5 times the inter inner quartile range. Anything outside that range is determined an outlier. But it seems that can be kind of arbitrary depending on the size of your data set or, you know, the nature of your data set. Um, so, Box plots can't hide information. I think nowadays a lot of people like to do like the dot the dot plots or something like an umbrella plot where you show like a distribution instead of a box plot and then like try to show like every dot in it. And so he, he seemed to be kind of a fan of that showing dots instead of um, you know bars or um, whenever possible or whatever it makes sense. I'm reading something from the chat. Yeah, the radial, I think that radar chart uh, thing, 
that's still a thing. Uh, yeah, there, so there's a lot of good links here. Uh, I'm going to link the site afterwards. Um, I'm going to have to spend up the entire time on here. Um, so a couple other things uh, with graphing. The, so you see this a lot too with the uh, you know, horizontal graphs are a lot easier to read most of the time, particularly because the labels on your X or Y axis, I guess it ends up in your Y axis, uh, they end up being horizontal, right? Like, which is easier for humans to read. I guess you can try to get around that by putting your um, labels like diagonal or something, or if your labels are really short, then maybe it works with the vertical bars. Um, and then usually when you're doing this, it's usually the better to sort them. And if you've ever watched, you know, David Robinson's like how you choose stuff, he has like that famous David Robinson plot where he does, does like a sorted bar chart. Um, and here they're doing like lollipop charts, which are can be a pretty good alternative um, for showing more dots instead of bars, um, showing more information in a more concise way. Um, and that kind of gets to the next point, the data to ink ratio. Uh, so use as little aesthetics as possible, like try to keep your chart as clean as possible. Um, uh, I think this goes to, I think maybe Edward Tuft was the one, Tufti was the one that really formalized this idea. I'm sure this has been around for centuries, but um, these brought this really to the forefront um, in like the database community. Uh, so that's everyone's trying to do that uh, nowadays. I think here actually linked to the spaghetti chart where there's just like a lot of unnecessary, well, here it's just like an unnecessarily um, complex plot where you got like a 3D type of bar charts here and there's cylinders, not even bars. So here, you know, simplifying it. Um, here, I mean, you could maybe even do more to kind of reduce um, uh, the amount of ink on the, on the chart. But I think that, you know, the general concept hopefully is clear. Uh, and then I think the last thing was color. Um, use color uh, only when necessary, you know, to, when to actually, when you're actually trying to distinguish categories, you know, it's awesome to make pretty charts, but if you're just using color for no reason, doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so here, I think, here's their example. It's like, yeah, you can show countries in different colors, but you know, you don't really need to. And like, especially here when the the size of the you know the bars are so different, and you're really gonna only be looking at maybe the top three to five, where they're already so distinguished, you don't really need the color for that. Uh, and here, yeah, you can use color for emphasis, like maybe highlight the first couple. So. I think that's a, a good thing just for anything, not just you know, statistics communication. Uh, and then, yeah, there's some discussion of like, I guess what I would call special model plots, um, where we have the partial effects plot, uh, where you're plotting uh, the response as a function of one variable at a time. So, you know, if you have like multiple uh, multivariate linear regression, it's taking one of your um, variables and um, plotting the, the response variable as a function of that while holding everything else constant. So, uh, and this really works well uh, with continuous predictors. Uh, and then like a slight generalization of that. I mean, I don't know if generalization is really the right word, but it's like, uh, it's related, it's a related type of plot. The, just the effects chart where you're showing essentially the response is a function of like two variables, um, often at like the difference between two variables. Uh, maybe I should show this. Uh, yeah, here, I should have put this on the same slide to help, you know, visualize this a little bit better. But here, you know, the response here is like shown horizontally. Um, I don't remember what the actual variable is here. Uh, but on the left, we can see essentially it's taking the difference between different variables that are different categories within a single variable. Um, you know, it's showing the, the interquartile range here along the, uh, along the dots and the lines here. Uh, so it's a different kind of, kind of plot. Um, and it's hard to describe in words until you see it. So maybe yeah, I definitely should put that all on the slide. Um, and the last kind of model, special model type of plot is a nomogram. I don't think I'd ever used this word before. Um, but it kind of makes, the, the plot makes sense. It's almost like a lookup table uh, for 
seeing how each individual variable or the response varies with each individual variable. So I think here, I think points was, I don't, I'm trying to remember, I think points was the, was either a response variable, one of these is a response variable, and then everything else is like a dependent variable. Um, so you can see how each kind of varies, <laughs> like at age 35, you know, points is approximately 18 here, um, body mass index, you know, around 30. Uh, if you look up the table all the way to points, it's around 18. Um, at least that was my interpretation of how you use this plot. Maybe I'm wrong on that. Like I've never actually used one of these before. Um, but my interpretation was that you kind of like almost use this like a table where you you look all the way to the right of your specific value of one of the dependent variables and then look up or down to where your response variable is and kind of maps that um, as like, you know, where if you're just predicting as a function of just that single variable, what the, what the response um, value would be. Uh, but yeah, I might be wrong on that. So someone, yeah, definitely correct me if I'm off on that. Uh, and then let me go back to the partial effects. So we had this plot in the book. I couldn't really think of a better way of showing it, so I just took his plot. Um, I, I guess what I did think was interesting here is um, this has, this does generalize to just like general like machine learning where we have these partial dependency plots. Uh, and I think you know, here they're using like uh, general linear model, random forest and a GBM model. And they're showing that like how the response varies with the single predictor variable. Uh, so I just thought that was cool that this concept, you know, not only applies to just regression and the type of regression we're going to see in this book, but just to really any um, kind of machine learning method. Uh, so yeah, we covered effects plot and then numbers. And then finally, let's tables. Um, I guess just another general thing. I think he had a lot of specific discussion for, you know, regression outputs or model outputs. Um, here, I just kind of like, my take on this is like, you know, when to use the uh, tables. Like, I, I just wanted to contextualize that. Like, first of all, if you can use a graph uh, and it's more appropriate to use a graph, I think it's almost always better to use a graph. But, you know, when to use tables, uh, the information form is when, when you want, the, when the user will want to look up, you know, individual values, that's when it can be really helpful. Otherwise, you know, use graphs. And there's a couple other things here uh, that they're all usually when you want to get dive more into the details, that's just that's a general reason to use the tables. But, I mean, I think if whenever you can first have a graph and then have the tables. Um, yeah, and then here I just wanted to cover a little bit about his specific recommendations for you know for binary um, response variables. Typically, you want to show the proportions, um, and I guess. Interesting point here is like you maybe only need to show one of the two proportions, right? Because the second proportion is implied by the first, um, especially if it's like a probability. You know, the probability of yes is seventy percent, and the probability of no is thirty percent. So you can figure that out. Uh, so interesting recommendation here was to not convert to percentages. And I think this point here was mainly uh, whenever you know in your discussion you're saying you know this increase the response rate by 30%, you know, that, that gets hard to interpret um, because when you say that you, there's no concept of what the baseline is or maybe the baseline is a certain value. Um, I, I, I guess in general, like when you say percent increase, you know, is it increased relative to, like, I guess what the old value was or is it, there's some other standard value that um, is a percent increase too, you know, and it's also, if it's like, you know, the response variable or whatever you're measuring before was like a value of like 90 instead of 100. Well, then when you say, you know, increase by 40%, uh, it's like, okay, do a, do 1.4 times nine or, you know, it, it's a, like a little bit of mathematical like gymnastics compared to, I think his recommendation was to just use fractions whenever possible. I think also it gets complicated whenever your numbers are like, on the decimal level or the low one, right? The percentages can kind of get weird um, when multiplying like that. Uh, and then with continuous variables, I think the interesting recommendation here was to use like three numbers or maybe 
maybe that's like something he specifically likes. I don't know. I don't know if there's any formal rules around that, but he was like, you know, use show like a lower middle and higher quartile or quantiles and then like really emphasize what the middle one is, whether it's the mean or the median. Uh, so yeah, just those are some interesting points. Uh, and then, yeah, finally, show confidence intervals where relevant. Um, and I think that's going to depend on the type of model. Um, so. And finally, yeah, a couple of the references to the data to biz site. I also like, I don't know, I can't really pronounce, I think it's Klaus Woke, Woke's site. Uh, he has a really good book. Um, I think we need to read that one day as a book club. Uh, it covers a bunch of, let me see. Um, Sorry for my super small font. You know, visually visualizing uncertainty. You know, what are some things to consider here? Um, so framing probabilities as frequencies. So here, like, I think this also this goes back to the percentages thing uh, we were just talking about. I think he tries to describe it as frequencies and, instead of probabilities. You know, he has good tips for how to visualize. You know, what's a one percent chance versus a forty percent chance? Other things like that. You know, database is a whole separate concept, but it's super important. Um, then you had Tom Mock's uh, recent summary of the Schwabish, Schwabish's principles here for making good tables. Uh, so yeah, I just left those links here in case anyone's interested. Uh, but yeah, that's all I really had. Um, that's more time than I thought I was going to spend talking about something, you know, seemingly as straightforward as descriptive statistics. Um, so hopefully it wasn't too boring. Tony, that was really great. Thank you. It got me thinking about a lot of things. One of them being, and it's not in this presentation, but one of the things I struggle with is log transforming my mm -hmm. actions. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know when it is a good idea to do so versus not, um, I've noticed that when I, I do log transform things, the the evolution of something might look dampened. So it goes back to your point about like communication and not wanting to make something seem like more dramatic than it is. I don't know. This is this is more a question for the whole group too, if you had any I don't know, any any advice or thoughts about when to lock transform and when not to lock transform and whether you should do it when you know your audience is like broad or maybe just reserve it for when your audience um, is very familiar with stats and numbers and so on. I was actually, I wasn't even thinking about the audience. I was just thinking when you brought that up, like more about you as a data analyst. So sometimes it just makes, I mean, you're, your data is not normal. So it's like, try the first thing I always think of is to, to try to log transform. And if that works, then I think the communication is the next part, right? Like, I mean, first of all, you just want to make sure the data analysis is done right. And, you know, oftentimes the log transformation can be good for that. And I didn't even think about how to, how difficult it can be to communicate. You know, hopefully in these COVID times, you know, we are all more used to log uh, <laughs> scales, but, you know, uh, yeah, data literacy is not a thing that's taught in school, uh, so it could be hard to kind of interpret that specific concept to any general audience. So I don't know, I guess I was just thinking of when you brought that up more from a practical point of view, because I know I've done that, you know, with work data all the time. It's like, it's definitely not normal. So the first thing I try is log, and it's usually pretty good. So then I just kind of keep working with it. But some, a lot of times I don't have to get to the point where I have to communicate that result. So. I don't know if I have a good answer for how to yeah, describe the log transformation. You know, maybe nowadays we can just point to, yeah, you remember, you know, during a, in March and April, we were all looking at those COVID charts, you know, they were using the, these log graphs. Um, maybe that's a good way to like, as a baseline, kind of try to communicate the idea of log transformations. Yeah. Or, I remember the main guy who was, um, who was making those COVID tracking charts. I think his name's like John, Murdoch, John Burns Murdoch or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, he, I don't remember the exact reasoning, but I know that he explained his reasoning for um, choosing to, to use the log scale. And I think it had to do, 
I don't want to butcher it, but it had to do with something like uh, he was like, we want these charts to be more informative than alarming. So I think he was really kind of taking he like he based that decision on the message that they were trying to send. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Asma, but I just remember um, I just remember watching that video, I think, where he kind of explained his reasoning behind a lot of, a lot of the choices that he made with those charts. Yeah, I would love to find that thread again, for sure. I was going to mention that um, there's a, I mean, part of the justification for using the uh, um, log transform, at least in the early stages of the pandemic, is because there was a mathematical reason that the, um, uh, the spread was not going to obey a linear uh, relationship. It was going to be exponential or uh, um, approaching exponential. And so by uh, doing a log transform, I don't I think it was not only uh, uh, potentially less alarming, but it was more informative in terms of uh, we know on a, on a log transform that exponential growth is a line. And so if it's if, if it was staying below the line, it meant that measures were working. So um, uh, I, I uh, for the most part, uh, anytime I, I saw a graph, uh, I, first thing I do is check the axes. And uh, if it wasn't uh, transformed, I, I, I pretty much wouldn't bother with it because um, we know what the spread of a contagious disease, what kind of pattern it follows. And to expect a line on a, a standard axis was, was um, was was not paying attention to the science. Mm -hmm. yeah, Another thing that, thumb that I find useful is like if you're comparing um, across groups and the orders of magnitude are really large, um, like you see this a lot with like revenue, like money, like you, you can get values that span huge ranges. And if you want to compare within groups, it's good to compress all the values down um, with the log transformation, because then when you do a box plot, for example, the the spreads will be observable instead of like one of your groups is like super tiny, just like a little line, and the other one's like really big. Uh, so that's a good use case. Yeah, that, I think that speaks more to like the practical, like right, like you can't you can't even visualize it if like the spread is so large. So it's like sometimes you just it's like not even about communicating. It's like it's just like to get the data in like a manageable, you know, visual format. But there's also a lot of times, right, with you know, the spread of disease, right, which is like it, it's exponential by nature. So, you know, it makes sense just from a mathematical point of view. One thing I've come across a couple times, which is kind of interesting to me, is um, doing a log two transform. So, you know, if you're doing a log two transform, you've got two, four is four, eight, 16. And those are kind of nice because you can just say, hey, this is double this. This is, you know, four times. This is, you know, so it's kind of a nice way to sort of not use a log 10 transform, but it's kind of nice because people can kind of visualize or at least think of, you know, oh, this is two times more. This is, you know, eight times more. This is, you know, so forth and so on because of log two jumps. Thought I'd just yeah, mention that. Yeah, exactly. I've seen David Robinson do that a lot, and he'll like put the two x for it, and it's really intuitive. It, I mean, I feel like you could get the uh, intuition across um, to even. Non yeah, yeah. Log twos are great. Sure. So, um, not to take this off this question, but yeah, I guess I, when I, I I'm just curious how much like how important visualization is to everyone and what they do, because uh, I know it helps me. Like a lot of times, like. You know, I work on something for like a week or two, and then it's like I got like you know five ten minutes where I talk about boss, and I'm just showing them a couple charts, and like that, you know, depending on his questions there, that kind of directs you know the next set of analysis that I'm gonna do. So it's like those charts are like so instrumental to me. So visualization is so instrumental for like just communicating the idea or whatever ideas I'm you know doing the analysis on. Um, so I guess I'm just curious, like for the rest of the group, how instrumental is for, for y'all, or maybe tables as well. Um, In the minds of uh, the stakeholders I work with, visualizations is probably all I do. They don't care about the prep or the analysis. They just they just see the visuals, just like you, Tony. So it's like the they're aware of that 
that end of it. I want to say that uh, I find visualization really useful as a, um, especially the first look at data, not only to see things like distributions, but to see potential errors. Um, so um, like today, a student was showing uh, a, a ggplot um, graph that she had made. And it was like the distri distribution of cell types in different samples. And I noticed that one of the bars was all one color. And I said, do you know what happened there? And she said, oh, that's a problem. And that we could pick it out right away because of the color coding. Uh, now we could have done a, like a summary or a, uh, you know, check for NAs or something else in the you know, BPLY R uh, universe, but it was just a, a, a useful way to say, does everything look the way I expected it to? And if it doesn't, what's going on? Yeah, no, I do. I do the same thing, and I didn't. Even, I didn't mention um, my favorite package for summarizing things in R is Schemar package. I was literally just using that like an hour ago because I had like a CSV file that someone handed to me. And I was like, well, I have no idea what the contents are, so let me just do Schemar on this, and um, you know, immediately started hammering our way, figuring out what certain things meant. Uh, you know, the whole tidyverse pipeline and stuff like that. Yeah, quick, getting a quick summary of your data, visualizing it. I, in this case, I was just looking at the histograms that the Schemar package prints out. Uh, but yeah, I also do that visualization first off in a data set. Uh, I just learned you, that you could group by and then use skim and it actually groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that blew that. my mind. I was like. <laughs> yeah, Tony, thank you so much for reminding me of skim R. I don't know why I forgot that package. That's an amazing package. I should just load that with tidyverse right away. Yeah, I have a question for people. Um, oh, go ahead, Adam. Adam. Oh no, I was just saying I haven't I haven't heard of that. That's definitely something I need to look into. Um, um, I guess go. Or, sorry, go ahead, Matt. No, no. Um, I just had a question, a curiosity question. Um, for example, I've got this data set right now that has seven hundred and forty-two uh, variables, and you know, doing box plots on seventeen hundred variables is just ridiculous. And, trying to think of different ways to sort of visualize it and kind of look at the data. And I'm wondering if other people have kind of come across very large data sets like that too, and what you've done. Yeah, uh, I help my brother out a lot with, <laughs> he works in like medical data and he has like the same problem where it's like a ton of columns. Uh, so I, tell, I typically will tell him to do like, if it's like so much data, do like a sample, like a sample track, like with the deployer. And then I usually will use VizDat, which is another package I should have like shown here. I think it's a B-I-S-D-A-T, those Brits and their S's. Um, it, you, you can, it shows a ggplot of like what the, what columns have which variables, where there's missing data uh, values in your data set. But it's like a visualization of your data frame as a plot. And like you can start hammering away that way as well. It's just like a, because Skimar can be kind of slow in large data sets, well, so, so is VizDat. But that's, I don't know, that like sampling the data, um, not only the rows, but sometimes the columns, because right there's like maybe there's that many columns, or you know, pivoting all the columns, <laughs> the, the pivot might take a while as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I guess sampling uh, is like the, probably the, where I would start with the, uh, like a massive data set like that. One of the things I've kind of done is, is um done a uh, zero variance or near zero variance cutoff. So, you know, if I have too many zeros, you know, in one column, I'll just throw out that column, you know, and I'll sort of get a cutoff based on that. And there's a nice caret sort of uh, command, if, if you know the package caret, that kind of helps you with near zero variance. And you can kind of, you know, cut and cut a little bit of the, the variables that way. And that's kind of one way you can slim it down, but you know, wonder you can't if can't visualize it, it either, though. Yeah, YDR, uh, this YDR package has like an SVD function where, so you'll get like, you'll do the singular value decomposition, you'll get for each column, but then you you visualize the weights by their their importance in each component. Um, that'd probably be, I mean, I, I, What's the package called again? It's YDR, W-I-D-Y-R by David Robinson. Oh, okay. And it's got a wider SVD and it's got a few um, functions that seem perfect for this use case. Oh, cool. The, the problem of keep um, things in a 
tidy format. Dimensionality reduction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, actually still it, keep your columns and then get the SVD output and rank each column within the um, components. And then you could visualize the columns and just in terms of um, their, their weights in each component. So that might be useful, I don't know. Yeah, I thought about doing some PCA work on it too, so yeah. And then he tends to throw them in like a network diagram where everything kind of connects based on, so you'd get like your features in like a network diagram with the, the vertices um, based on their weights in each component. A right. network diagram. Use oh. a few of the important components, then get the weights from those to, to weight your, your column, your features, and visualize it in a network. Do you have a reference on that? Yeah, let me actually share it in the in the um, chat. It's I'll actually share two things. I'm going to share the the reference and then his um, talk where he goes through doing this with um, UN votes. Actually. Oh, nice. I was going to comment that uh, this this sort of problem, Matt, that you're dealing with, is a common problem in um, uh, massive sequencing uh, uh, DNA RNA. Uh, so, for example, one technique that's become quite popular in recent years is single cell transcriptomics, where you're, you're uh, splitting up a tissue into individual cells mm. and then determining RNA uh, uh, transcripts in each cell. So what you have are potentially thousands or tens of thousands of cells and potentially tens of thousands of genes. Uh, and uh, generally the cells are the, are the uh, observations and the gene, the re gene reads are the variables. So you have a huge matrix. And um, uh, the bioconductor packages that have been developed for that are designed to um, pretty quickly condense the data using uh, PCA or using actually there's a, a new uh, a new variation of PCA, and uh, I, I'm blanking on the name of it, but uh, like PMAP or IMAP or UMAP, yeah, UMAP, yeah, <laughs> UMAP. I'm thinking of something like TSE. Oh, uh, TSNE. Sorry, TSNE. Oh, TSNE. TSNE. That's what it is. TSNE. So yeah. TSNE, which uh, because your goal generally is to figure out how many different cell types do I have in this tissue. And so you're using, you're not really interested in the uh, uh, expression of any one gene in particular. You're, look, you're looking for patterns and trying to decide by these, these separation techniques uh, how many different cell types you can identify. Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, we need to, we need to just have like, uh, like an unsupervised learning talk where we can talk about, you know, we just mentioned like, you know, uh, TSNE, UMF. Uh, even stuff like we were talking earlier, K-means, PCA, SPD, all that stuff can be used for uh, like unsupervised learning. <laughs> I don't know what, what this group, uh, that we're really, really into that topic already. <laughs> uh, Tony, would you mind if I uh, shared my screen? Yeah, let me go ahead and stop sharing. Okay, um, in, in answer to the question about um, using log scale and when to use it, this is a Tidy Tuesday uh, from last year, one of the first ones I participated in that was comparing wine ratings to uh, prices. And when I started playing with this, what I realized is that the wine ratings only go from 80 to 100, but the prices start shooting up uh, right after 85 or so. Uh, like 80 to 85, it's just jug wine or whatever. But then after that, um, everything was kind of increasing, the median price is increasing exponentially. And so then when I did a log transform on the price, I found that there's pretty much a linear relationship. I mean, pseudo linear between 85 and like 98, 97. And I thought that was, I thought it was actually, I was ha happy to find that because it, it, it kind of informed that Every, every rating point increased not by a set dollar amount, but by a, a dollar percentage, a price percentage from the, from the previous, um, um, uh, price, a previous uh, rating level. 
And I think that's one example of when log transform uh, can come in useful when you have, as, as uh, Tan said, uh, you have a lot of data down at one end of the distribution, and then you have all these points that are important, but distorting the scale at the high end of the distribution. And there are few, many fewer points, but they're weighting more in terms of the distribution. Can, can I throw a question out there? I just realized, I guess, relating to data viz. So um, I've been playing around with like tracking data in, in sports and, um, and I had a, like, I wanted to visualize an angle over time. And I don't know if anyone has any like ideas on how to do that rather than just kind of animating something and showing how it turns. Oh, hey there. I would say animating something and showing how it turns is probably pretty good. Yeah, it is, but then it's just my laptop isn't like the greatest, and GG Animate makes it sound like an airplane, so I don't want to do that all the time. What angles are you looking at? I mean, how much does it go between? I mean, it it, it could literally be the whole the whole circle, right? Like it, it's a person, so they could they could be facing one direction at any point, or any direction at any point in time. Uh I mean, you could just do like a singular line instead of like a, you know, a cone or something to represent their field of vision. Um, but yeah, I don't know. GG Anime, you know, will have performance issues almost no matter what. So I don't know. Don't let that stop you. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I've been doing it, but I was just wondering if there was maybe like an easier or quicker way, if any, or if anyone had any ideas or experience with that. Um, I mean, other than like, you know, restructuring, I guess, what you're trying to show. Um, if you're really just yeah, trying to show field of vision um, or something, you know, a cone or a line is going to be best. But I don't know if you're, like, willing to, like, completely restructure, you know, what the analysis you're trying to do and do some, like, dimensionality reduction like we're talking about, uh, then it would be, you know, visualization of that, that other thing. But uh, I don't know. I don't know if there's any good alternatives to that. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll keep you guys. What about a simple XY time? plot? You have, uh, you know, X is your time, Y is your your angle. You know, you just go between zero and 360. Uh, yeah, uh, I did try that. But then you have these weird moments, right, where um, you go from, like, you jump from zero to 360. You know what I mean? So it's, like, smooth, and all of a sudden Instantaneous, it's... Instantaneous, yeah. Yeah, you get that huge jump. So I, I, it, does, it does work, right? But then there's that extra little bit of, like, uh, mental gymnastics, I guess, to be like, all right, is, is this really smooth? Because I guess that's what I'm trying to figure out, right? When I look at these angles, is I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out if these ang if if this is a good um, number. Here, I'll just give you a bit more context. So basically, it's it's a player's orientation, right, on the field. So it's not their their movement vector; it's the area that they're looking, um, or like the direction in which they're looking. So I want to know is this like, is this a smooth turn, right? Does this make sense? Can I trust this data? or not did you, you could did you use apply, like smoothing on it already um or i haven't i haven't not yet the, right now i just want to know if it was even <laughs> worth using right like if there was even any good signal in there or is it just like super wishy-washy and not even worth looking at so what about is... like um uh, what about I'm like sorry. dot plots where the center like zero zero is also like zero seconds and then as you go further away from the origin is like your time axis and then you're like a radial plot with the angle that they're facing yeah so oh, just I see. Radial okay, I see what coordinates instead of cartesian coordinates because it's a radial data set anyway and just right? over time it just gets a bit longer right as and it gets further away yeah, from the farther center, from yeah, the middle as they as as time goes on so like you have dot plots I'm envisioning dots. You could try lines, but I guess that would be messy. But you would do dots that like get further and further away from the center as mm -hmm. time goes on, and then you would plot a court like a like on a, like a radial coordinate system. You know what angle that they were facing at that time. Yeah, that I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and then okay, like I'll, if it's I'll a smooth turn, the, the the it should be like a, like the line should like connect right. 
Mm. And then if it's like jerky, you'd go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between your dots. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Wait, Adam, Tony, it's not, it's not for the big data bull. I was actually trying to, <laughs> I, I, wanted to, I wanted to put some code out there to help other people, I guess, with the big data bull. I don't think I'll participate myself, but I'll be really interesting to see what the question is and what people come up with. What, oh, the question hasn't come out yet? Not that I know. Next week. Oh, uh, lovely. Sorry, Adam, is what's important to you where the player is looking or what what is changing? Okay, so here, I, I guess I'll, I'll rewind a little bit. So yeah, it is it is NFL data, right? So I, I've just been, you can scrape um, some of the NFL's tracking data off their next gen stats site. So not only do they have the players' locations, but they also have their speeds, right? And then they have um, the, they have their speed and they have their orientation. So you know where they're looking and the direction in which they're moving, right? But I know that in past seasons, that orientation data has been really bad. But maybe it's a little bit better now, right? Like maybe it's actually worth using now. So the idea that I want to do is just like quickly just to get a, a general idea of like, oh, is, is this orientate? does this orientation data make sense now, right? Like, is it, does it seem like, okay, this is the way a player might actually be turning as they're moving around on the field? So what is being tracked, their helmet position or their shoulders or? or, or? I, think it's, I think it's two chips in their shoulders. I think that's how they're doing it. Okay. And you're trying to assess like the quality, like is it randomly blipping and sampling it like too frequently or infrequently that it doesn't make sense? Like there's no pattern? That's what you're yeah. trying to figure out? Yeah, I, yeah, I just want to know like, is, does this, like does this jive with what I actually see on the field, right? Like does this look like the direction that the player would actually be moving? Is he turn? Does it make sense for them to be turning at this rate? I guess, yeah, just generally, like, is this valid? Yeah, I don't know. Like, you'd have to, try, if you're just trying to, yeah, justify or like verify the validity of the data, if you can like somehow get clips of the, you know, the actual play as well, you know, that's probably the best thing to view a couple of plays side by side. Yeah, um, that's, that's, that's what I did, uh, at least for, for the one like kind of example I've just been working on. And I definitely noticed um, that there are some players where I'm pretty sure the chips are like flipped in their shoulder pads because it's like a defender at um, like when the ball is hiked and their orientation is completely away, right? Like they're not even looking at the, at the ball in any way. So just like figuring out little tricks, like, okay, let me just look at when, when the ball is hiked, where is everyone looking? Because they're probably like, you know, the offense is probably facing forward and all the defensive players are probably facing their respective forward, right? Yeah, yeah I'll, uh, I'll keep you guys posted. On, on, on it's what a really interesting hijacked our conversation here. It's like, let me, let me just get everyone to you know, help me out with this. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't mean to hijack it. Uh, what, but, what if you looked at the first derivative? You know, I mean, you know, what occurred to me is, you know, maybe you have a player that's running, you know, down the field and then immediately, immediately, excuse me, immediately pivots 180 degrees to catch the ball. I yeah. mean, something like that would be, would show up in a first derivative. That might be kind of interesting too. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to try that out. I think it's a really cool challenge. I, 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 I like thinking about it like, for example, which players would show, so you'd expect probably linemen to show the least variance in orientation, whereas like quarterbacks and receivers are probably going to be spinning around quite a bit. Yeah. And I think like you notice with cornerbacks a lot or like defensive backs, they're, they're spinning around a lot because it's a very reactive position, I guess. Is it, is it even consistent between like plays or like it's always like flipped around? Uh, you know, that yeah, so I, so I don't have like as much data as I would like, but I think I looked at two plays where I got to see the same defender on the field and yeah, it looked like he was flipped on both of them. So I think it's, I think it is consistent in that regard, but I mean, even, so I guess going back to your original question, Tony, of like how, how important is data viz, uh, I mm -hmm. guess, but like, so some of the stuff I've been doing with it, it's all just vectors, right? And I'm trying to like figure out vector projections and things like that. And it's, it's way easier to just do the math and then plot it and then, be, and then look at it like, 
okay, does this, does this math make sense? Right. Is this putting up the picture that I thought it would? Um, because you can definitely, or I definitely found errors in my code through like, I was like, oh, that picture does not make sense. I did something wrong. So yeah, I think, I think data viz is, is really important, at least in like the stuff I work on personally, just to, as like sanity checks. It's like communicating with yourself. <laughs> Instead of yeah. not only communicating with others, you need to communicate to yourself that the idea and the code is right. Yeah, because I, I think when you're when you're coding and when you're working on like bigger problems, it stuff gets so abstract and it, it gets really difficult sometimes to to like ground yourself and and check that everything that you're doing is is right or or making sense or doing what you wanted it to do. I appreciate the help, guys. I will report back to you if I figure something out. <laughs> Hold you responsible on like a blog post, you know, no later than one week from now. This, this is what I'm going for. This is what I'm going for. <laughs> I'll, I'll post it. I'll post it in the group if I ever figure it out. I've never seen the plot that I was talking about, by the way. I'm just kind of like, I was just trying to like visualize the data. Um, so if you actually draw that plot, I'd be curious to see if it was like, if it's completely, if it any use at all. Um, yeah, as yeah. To like the Chichi animate part. I'll, yeah, I'm, I feel like that's going to end up being a project that I, or a little side project. I'll, I'll, I'll try to post what I get in the, uh, in the group. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't Go ahead. have any more. I, I had a, a very quick last one. What is an, a good alternative to stacked bar charts? Uh, uh, let me see if that thought you had something. <laughs> what is a good alternative to stacked bar charts? Sometimes I like group bar charts. You just group C together, A, B, and C, A, B, and C. And you yeah. kind of look at, it depends. Can't you facet as well in those circumstances? Yeah, so I, it's showing here like faceting can be pretty helpful. Um, we're converting them to lines. And that's not um, always possible, I think. Yeah, there, these are uh, somebody, but the, these are used a lot to show like the relative proportion of something to another. Uh, I, I never really liked the 100% stacked bar chart. I just, it's hard to interpret for me. I, there, there was a, um, somebody who was using chiclet bar charts. So, um, I don't know if you if, could you could you could you um, Google for a chiclet bar chart? Oh yeah, Bob oh, Bob Gigi uh, like chiclet. C uh, well with the K, C A H I C L E T. Like that? Yeah, but not G G. I don't think. I think just R chiclet maybe. Yeah, I don't know if it's called. <laughs> 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 are those like are these like waffle plots? Uh, chiclet sure. with the K and the GG, and I think that's a package. It helps, yeah, it's it helps with viewing the space a little bit better. <laughs> there we go. Oh, interesting. I guess combined with good color schemes, like you did here, it can it can definitely make sense. Very I mean, cool. I, I, you won't have an alternative all the time, so you know. It's not like, you know, don't oh, never use deck bar charts, but, uh, you know, sometimes, well, a lot of times there will be a good alternative. But yeah, these are visually appealing. And another question. I mean, I just use Harbor themes no matter what, so it's great. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Do we know any packages that are good at gluing a plot with a table. I know I can figure it out another way. I just wondered if there was a package that does that easily. A patchwork won't work with GT. No, it does. I I love patchwork. I use it a lot. But I'm I'm wondering uh, if there's a better one to get the table and the graph to line up more nicely. Like a, like, a, like a DT, like a data table. 
Yes, like like gluing a data, t like imagine a data table that I would glue right next to a plot like this. In shiny? No, in, in anything. Or a, a data table like like if you used GG, uh, like that, whatever the GG package for tables, is that what you mean? Like, like you generate it and you have like a picture of a table and then you want to glue that with a plot? Exactly, yeah. Okay. You could use image magic. You take like a you know PNG version of a table and like combine the two PNGs together, like post process it. Uh, mm -hmm. That's kind of a hacky solution. Uh, yeah, I, think, I think uh, um, that would that probably wouldn't work because you wouldn't be dynamically updating the table if you have new data. Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. I just throw them into boxes that are in the same fluid row in my shiny apps and then like I have a plot <laughs> right next to my table but that's not the same thing that we were asking for uh yeah I don't know I was just <laughs> at Tom Mock on Twitter and I feel like he'll give you something good in, like, <laughs> in a day or two yeah some, some of the tiny Tuesday people too like some of the best guys like you can just go look at their I don't know if I've seen the yeah their table with the plot though so not even Maybe you can't really find a good example. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe <laughs> Tom Rock probably does. He does a good. Yeah, this sounds like a problem he solved a long time ago. <laughs> or you can put your chart inside the table, like for each row or something, and you like click Spark lines. That. Spark lines in the table. Yeah. I've seen. I've definitely seen that. I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen the. Oh, that's in my tool. Right? Yes. What you guys are talking about? Yeah, like the widget inside the ch the plot widget inside of your data table. I'm plugging my tool <laughs> since I'm sharing this. <laughs> um, but we have one more thing to talk about before leaving, and that's who's going to take the next chapter. So the next one is very big. It has 14 sections. So I'm thinking maybe we should split it. Or if someone feels ambitious, they can definitely take it all. And the topic is statistical inference. We need to draw lots here. Yeah. Well, we were our group. How many are we with Maya? We're nine. Uh, Small straws. I, I'll I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll I'll split it with somebody. Okay. Awesome. Do you want to take the first half, and then we figure out who the second half will go to next week? Yeah. In fact, why don't I just plan on presenting the first half next week, so we don't get. Uh, well, I haven't really looked at the chapter yet. I, how many? Pages is it? Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, let me do. Um, let me do five one through five eight. Okay. That seems great. The, the good thing is this isn't like university where you know, like in a single lecture, you cover like four chapters. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> And even him in his course, he sometimes didn't finish a chapter. So it was just a lot to talk about. He glosses over a lot of things. And I think given that we're trying to understand these as beginners and not domain experts, it's okay if we take our time and just make sure that we're understanding as much as possible. These aren't too complicated. You can probably whip, rattle those off pretty quickly, I would think. Yeah. So is, is this your the app you wrote? Yeah, and these are the cool little spark lines. This is pretty basic. Apparently this guy, or no, is it this guy? Or maybe Timely Portfolio has better looking ones and more customizable. So maybe if I have time, I'll, I'll change it to that. He's like, he's like an OG like JavaScript R person, so I wouldn't. <laughs> Like if yours doesn't look at quite as good as LNF, that's I think that's kind of fine. It's probably okay. like the best. This is really interesting. 
at first glance, this is this looks terrific, Asma. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's in my it's my pin tweet. If you want to check it out, um, I'm actually using it right now to figure out where I should go on vacation. <laughs> so I need to take a vacation, and I'm looking at maybe California. What's up with Alabama? <laughs> they don't do testing. Oh, it's uh, just anomalies and how they report. And in order for us to get accurate predictions, we need the stuff to be as accurate as possible. And they've been changing up definitions sometimes for cases. So we prefer to just keep them gray until. I was going to make Alabama a punchline, but. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You, know, you had a good explanation. Yeah, this looks I've, like I've been doing something similar with Mexican data. And today I ran it for the class and realized that they yesterday they added new variables and everything broke. <laughs> so it was a it was an object lesson and don't trust that your code is always going to continue to work because the government might start adding variables to the data set. Right, exactly. Cool. All right. Thanks guys. Thanks everyone. Have a great night. I'll see you next week. Bye.